shoppers confused by blood-red honey quickly discover the shocking truth. During a sweltering New York City summer, the bees turned red. Little by little, each member of the hive glowed a suspicious crimson, which quickly turned the honey into an unrecognizable bloody syrup. Frankly, it freaked people out. They needed to know the potential environmental ramifications. So, insect experts in Brooklyn set out to find answers. It took beekeepers, small business owners, and the police several years to get to the bottom of why the honey turned red. And all involved were completely blown away by the source of this strange transformation. A strange miracle of nature cropped up around Brooklyn in the summer of 2010, where beekeepers noticed a reddish hue to the bellies of their bees. Soon enough, their honey yield was just as rosy. They worried about what the red color meant for the bees' survival. Were they suffering the effects of pesticides? Or perhaps this was a climate-induced issue, given that New York City was in the midst of its hottest summer on record. Granted, bee populations globally took a hit from colony collapse disorder, which still has no definable cause. While the beekeepers knew the potential hazards of raising colonies, nobody had ever heard of spontaneously red honey, though the industry was totally new to the city. Beekeeping in New York City was banned under Mayor Rudolph Guiliani, though there were still several rogue operations carefully disguised on rooftops. In March of 2010, the ban was lifted, quadrupling the number of hives by summertime. So, full-time educator and part-time beekeeper Tim O'Neill suggested that the red substance could be ethylene glycol, a toxic chemical famous for its sweetness. He reasoned the bees were drawn to the liquid from MTA bus service depots. Cerise Mayo, a beekeeper on Governor's Island, also had bees producing red honey, which meant whatever was causing this anomaly somehow reached across 600 yards of water, separating them from the red hook cases. To determine if the honey was actually poisoned with ethylene glycol, or any other contaminant the keepers hadn't considered, Tim O'Neill sent samples of his honeycomb off for lab testing at the New York State Apiculturist in Albany. When the test came back, the results showed the culprit. F, D, and C, red number 40. The bees were ingesting a food-safe dye somewhere around Red Hook, Brooklyn, and pretty soon, the keepers had a hunch about the source of the color. Dell's Maraschino Cherries Company, founded in 1948, was a three-generation run family business, and an institution for the neighborhood of Red Hook. It just so happened that a key ingredient of their fruit confections was F, D, and C, red number 40. Murmurs of the Cherry Factor's involvement turned to hard fact when the New York Times ran a front-page headline. In mystery and culture clash, some Brooklyn bees turn red. Still, some questioned whether it was all a joke. Governor Island beekeeper Cerise Mayo was quoted in the Times article, which some people took as an attempt at humor. They thought her name was fake because Cerise is a French word for cherry. Most people took the initial article as a story about gentrification. On one side, there was Arthur Mondella, the owner-operator of Dell's Maraschino Cherries Company, and on the other were the modern beekeeping gentrifiers pointing the finger. There was pointedly no comment from Arthur Mondella in the story, and he wasn't answering calls. He was, however, trying to remedy the problem quietly on his own. Arthur spoke to Andrew Cote from the New York City Beekeepers Association and arranged a meeting. As to avoid lurking reporters, Arthur met Andrew Cote at the factory one morning at 5 a.m. Arthur was ready and willing to learn how to put some screens up, make the lids on his bins tighter, and control the spills, as Cote remembered. When they parted ways, Arthur Mondella paid Andrew Cote for his services. No cherry puddles were going to leak out of the factory anymore. All was well. In fact, the beekeepers were thankful Arthur called one of their own rather than an exterminator. This, however, was not the end of the mystery. One group spotted the article in the paper and wasn't willing to let bygones be bygones, the Brooklyn District's Attorney Office. There was a reason Arthur Mondello was so willing to sweep his cherry puddles under the rug. It was a long-held NYPD suspicion that Dell's Maraschino Cherries Company was covering up a criminal operation. On more than one occasion, the lingering odor of marijuana was reported beneath the sickly sweet cherry smell. Postal workers called it in, neighbors noticed, but even a drug-sniffing dog wasn't able to pinpoint a marijuana scent. Lack of evidence made the DA's office move the cherry factory to the back burner until 2013 when Kenneth Thompson was elected. 
Under Kenneth Thompson, the DA's office cracked down on environmental infractions, which brought the maraschino honeybee caper back to the surface. On February 24th of 2015, the Department of Environmental Protection, the NYPD, and the Brooklyn DAs went to Dell's Maraschino Cherries Company, search warrant in hand. From Arthur Mandela's perspective, this was an ambush. According to the warrant, they were searching for evidence of the illegal dumping of wastewater, which limited the scope of where they could look. That didn't keep them from a major discovery. During the search, they discovered what appeared to be a false wall in Arthur's office. Things were looking grim. The authorities requested a second search warrant to gain access to the hidden area, and Arthur took a moment to relax in the bathroom. After a few minutes, Arthur didn't return. Police officers hammered on the locked door, telling Arthur to open up. But he wouldn't budge. Instead, he requested his sister Joanne come to the door, where he called to her to take care of my kids. Moments later, the sound of a gunshot echoed through the factory. Arthur Mondella took his own life with a 357 Magnum pistol he had concealed in an ankle holster. He must have seen no way to reckon with the consequences of what the police were about to uncover. Shifting aside the false wall, police saw a ladder that led them to a sprawling 2,500-square-foot basement turned into a substantial growing operation. In total, 100 plants were recovered, thriving under the LED grow lights. Each discovery added to the overtly cinematic narrative, 130,000 in cash, a secret garage full of luxury cars that included a Rolls-Royce and a Bentley, plus many books about plant husbandry and other entitled The World Encyclopedia of Organized Crime. In spite of the weird Breaking Bad-style tragedy that unfolded at the Maraschino Cherry Factory, the DA's office didn't go for the jugular. The company's new owners, Arthur's daughters, Dana Mandela Benz and Dominique Mandela, paid a $1.2 million fine. No one will know the fear and shame Arthur Mandela experienced moments before his death, but we do know what probably would have happened if he lived. Based on the charges, he would have served maybe one to three years behind bars, but probably wouldn't have gotten probation. He was very private. We'd ask him questions when we were little, and his response would be, What are you, writing a book? Dana Mandela told the New Yorker. The sisters picked up the baton of the family business without a hiccup, thanks to their sizable inheritance. Other than the book in the basement, there was no evidence of any connection to organized crime. After a lawsuit that the family filed against the city for their handling of the search was dismissed, they argued that the judge had prejudicial views of Italian Americans. While the chapter of the great mystery was put to rest and the bees and their honey had long since returned back to gold, the Mandela family grieved. They mourned Arthur and came to terms with why a proud small business owner would do what he did. Investigators can't be sure how Arthur Mandela went about distributing the drugs or over how long a period of time he operated. Some people have blamed the bees for narking out a family man, but it's not that uncommon for nature to foil crimes.